And um, so the way this is going to work is that we will, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Dan some questions for about 30, 40 minutes. Let me get my phone out so that I can check the time so I don't indulge myself too much. And then it will be your turn to ask questions. And everyone asks a question will get a t-shirt or a tote bag uh, <laughs> based on what we have available. Um, but I think our, our selection looks pretty good tonight. So you probably get what you want. Um, so uh, Dan Salit is a filmmaker and a film reviewer and a cinephile. He's all three of those things. Uh, <laughs> And so we're, we, we just saw a movie of his. I feel like th no one I've ever had on Night Owls has had a better introduction than having their movie mm -hmm. shown before you. This is who he is. You know who he is. You just saw his movie. Um, but he's also someone who I think is just has a love of movies that goes very deep. It goes so deep that when I look at his lists of like top movies from every year, I haven't heard of any of the titles of them. <laughs> so he's seeing a lot of movies that most, many of us haven't even heard of. Um, that can uh, be very deep or very shallow, depending. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and I'm very honored to have you here. Thank you so much for coming to talk Thank to us. Um, uh, OK, so uh, uh, Dan and I had dinner last night. And something he said to me that really struck me was, um, that here's, here's, I'm putting it in my own words, that he tries to be a blank slate when he watches a movie. So like, it made me realize how much when I watch a movie, I indulge my proclivities. I'm like, oh, I don't like that actor, or oh, this, like, this, this, this annoys me, or like, this isn't my kind of movie, or like, I, I let myself have like, pet peeves and like, tastes, and like, a movie can push my buttons or irritate me, and it hadn't ever even occurred to me to try to not do that. Um, to try to like not put myself into the viewing of the movie. And I think so many of us, it's just, we take it for granted that we're going to watch movies in that way. So my first question for you is, are you able to do that with respect to your own movie? That would be like the ultimate challenge. Can you be a blank <laughs> slate and like watch your, mo your own movie as a movie? I'm not even able to do it with other people's movies when I try. It's an aspirational kind of thing. It, it, I think that trying helps, but it's you know it's some kind of transcendental goal that you never get to. There's too much of you that interferes. And as far as like your own movie, good good question actually, because it, when you're making something, it's just the opposite. Like you don't try to you don't try to like clear the slate. You don't try to get yourself out of there. You try to put yourself in there and then make something with it. I mean, there is part of you that wants to judge it the way that a film viewer will judge it. There's part of you that wants to do a check along the way and several times, actually, all the way through to make sure that you haven't generated something crazy. But the part of you that generates it, that's like really different. That part of you is like wild and personal, and you just need something unusual and weird and that the part of you that shapes it later on might be a little bit more like the good cinephile that is you know able to you know find balance but now and what did you notice this time when you watched it you know i i liked it there's all kinds of little things there's all kinds of little deliveries little moments that i would do differently and I also felt like they didn't matter that much, at least not to me. I felt like I kind of liked what was going on. And Tally is so exciting for me to watch always that, that I, I think basically it's OK. I feel like a lot, of, a lot of defects, like when I watch somebody else's movie, I can handle a whole lot of defects. And I, it doesn't really enter into my judgment. There's certain things that I care about more than whether like little things on the surface go wrong. So in this case, I was kind of reacting a little bit like that. It's like, I wish I used a different take of this. I wish I'd insisted that they get rid of that inflection. But basically, I was kind of with my own movie. <laughs> I kind of liked it. That's really interesting, though. Like, I, I, it, uh, it makes total sense to me, but I wouldn't have predicted that your response to it would be like trying to correct it. <laughs> so that, that, which is to say, you're very far from being a, a, like a, a blank slate viewer, you're, you're viewing it as the maker of it. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, part of me is. And then part of me was 
having a good time despite that. So I think it's split, split personality. Like the person generating the movie and the person appreciating the movie both have to be involved mm. and the rules are different for those two people. So at the end, you, you dedicate this movie to Romer. Um, is he someone you see as an influence on you? Yeah. <laughs> That's an easy question with a short answer. Yeah. OK, so here's a question I had, because I assume that there would be a number of filmmakers that you see as an influence. And I read you a, an interview where someone said, how do you think, how do you deal with criticism? Like, you know, other critics review your movies and they might say negative things about them. And you say that I try not to incorporate it actually too much, the criticism, because you want to have like your own voice. And I wonder, why is it OK to be influenced by Romare, but not by a critic? Because Romare is cool. <laughs> <laughs> So you, it's just that you think like Romare knows more about making movies than a critic. If the critic yeah. knew as much as Romare, then you could be influenced by him? Well, I think being influenced is not a bad thing. Maybe after you make the movie, there's not too much point in like applying your influences, but it's fine. It's a fine thing. Romare was a, a particularly nice person to have around, but I... You know, there are certain critics, certainly, that went into whatever, making whatever I consider myself now. I grew up, you know, reading Andrew Saris and Robin Wood in a really devoted way. Later on, I got into the French writer Bazin and a lot of the new wave critics. They were, they were definitely formative, the, uh, something I take away from a lot of those things. So it's not, I didn't mean to, you know, diss well, all critics. But maybe, I, I guess, maybe there, to me, there is something interesting about the distinction between being influenced by critics um, uh, in the way that you're influenced when you read film criticism in the abstract, and then you're someone right. giving a criticism of a specific movie and thinking, oh, in the next movie, I won't do that, right? So I thought maybe there's some kind of distinction there about the kind of influence. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's possible. I can't think of any specifics. But it's possible that if somebody made a really uh, a comment that I agreed with about something I shouldn't have done, I would make a little mental note if, I, if I've been won over to that point of view. I think that's reasonable. But that's not usually the way it is. Usually people are reacting to what they see. And you know, it's rare, that, it's rare that a critic feels about the film exactly the way you do. That was basically, I think, what I must have been mm -hmm. reacting to in that interview. And it doesn't really pay to try to be, you know, you're just gonna be blown by the wind hither and thither if you like take everybody's reaction as being similar to yours. You have to hope that you've gone through some preparation, that you've arrived at being like a human being who like thinks about movies and makes movies and that your take on it's as, as good or bad as anybody else's. So I want to ask you about, like, so to me, the way I sort of experience this movie is that it's all leading up to one scene. And that scene is where um, Jackie and her brother are in the bedroom, and mm -hmm. uh, she, and they talk about, you know, he talks about their childhood sort of erotic experiences, and then, like, he, and he storms off at the end of it, right? Um, and so, but first, my first question to you is like, do you also see it that, do you see that as kind of the most important scene in the movie? Uh, or is that, is that just me? No, you're, you're completely right from a dramatic point of view. And if, if I were gonna disagree with it, I would have to say that there are other layers besides the okay. drama. So the film does have a certain structure where it wants that scene to be something you're building towards that dissipates a certain tension. And then after that, it's all kind of clean up. Yeah. And that's a dramatic, structure and I wanted that and I think that that's important at least in this movie it's important because it, you know there's people that want things and so that that itself creates that dramatic structure but uh, there's other levels too there's you know levels of, of character and theme and all the things you think about and I don't know if I would you know collapse all those into the same level and say that that was the most important scene for all of those did you do more takes of that scene than the other? I don't remember. No, I don't think so. Okay. I don't it seems so perfect to me. So I'm like, <laughs> you did like a ton of takes of it. I don't think so. I tend to do a lot of takes in general. That's why I don't think so. I see. I see. Okay. And so like what to me, a, uh, an interesting feature of this movie is that 
it's about incest, which is a very taboo topic, and you kind of tiptoe your way into it. Um, even the, you know, there's like a revelation to her therapist that turns out not to have really been the revelation because the therapist didn't. Uh, and, and, and then that, that scene is where, it's almost like you had to prepare, the, the, the viewer is very shocked by the very topic of incest, and you had to like prepare them for coming as close as you did in that scene. Like, is, is that how you think about it? Because the movie, it's also a very, a lot of ways a very calm movie. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway, I'm just interested to hear you say a little more uh -huh. about how, how this movie how handles the incest topic. Outrage figures in. Uh, let me see, there's a couple things I could say about that. I guess one of them is that partly there's like a, a certain rebellious part of me that starts with that. Obviously, you wouldn't make this movie if you just didn't want to ruffle anyone's feathers right. whatsoever. So some part of me is thinking, geez, you know, look at it. That's the whole idea of this movie is that there's somebody who's mysteriously different than the rest of us or than most of us in this regard, and yet she's the same in a lot of ways, is that if that's uncomfortable, we should really deal with it because that's the way life is. People are very different from us, and yet they're very much the same as us. Um, but having, broached, having chosen that subject, I do all the way through give Jackie and maybe the film in general, some awareness that it's a potentially uncomfortable thing. And a lot of the scenes in the film, I think, have the goal of getting humor out of the fact that it's a known uncomfortable topic and that people have to step around it in this movie because of Jackie. And, and there's various kinds of, there's various scenes that play with it in a way that is humorous and also kind of maybe conveys the filmmaker's perspective that, you know, it's not, it's, it, that the film is aware that this is kind of a minefield in, in certain ways. I had this thought on the last time I viewed it that maybe there was a suggestion or some kind of hint towards mother-son incest with the mother and Will as well. Because, um, you know, the mother's like, reacts similarly to Will leaving as Jackie does to Matthew leaving. People have said that. I wasn't thinking that way. I wasn't thinking of an echo there. I wanted Jackie to be a little bit of a singularity in the world. Um, I just was trying to flesh out this family. There's an absent father, and I feel as if that relationship between mother um, an eldest son, when the father especially is not a force in it, can, is an intense one. Um, at least that was what I was thinking, and that was what I was filling out there. The mother is such a mysterious character uh -huh. in this movie. Uh -huh. Like, she, you just, you know, she writes, and you don't know what she's reading, what she's writing, and there's that, like, that tantalizing <laughs> scene where you can sort of read some of it, but it doesn't last long enough. And as a, like, as a filmmaker, like, there's something, I don't know, frustrating, intriguing about these mysterious characters where we'll never, we'll never understand them and we don't even get a chance to understand them. Mm -hmm. what, like, say something about why, why you put such a character out there for us. You know, how could I? Film is, film is like, lends itself very naturally to mystery, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You're on the outside of things. You're not on the inside. You're seeing things from the point of view of an observer who doesn't have uh, the dirt on whatever it is you're seeing, doesn't have the psychology, doesn't have the history, doesn't have everything that's needed to put stuff together. And I like to work with that tendency of film rather than against it. Literature is very much the opposite. It kind of makes you feel as if you can inhabit a person's thoughts very easily or <coughs> Excuse me, or get inside something. But film ha is so naturally outside of things that I find it moving very often to to multiply all the sources of mystery. If I have a little corner of the film that's not, you know, I, I have to fill out. I, I often will fill it out with something mysterious and that we don't quite understand, but something that will hopefully remind us of something we've seen or resonate with us as a kind of. Uh, 
you know, something real or possible. It's interesting because this question of whether we want mystery or the familiar is, of course, a theme in the movie itself, mm -hmm. right? And Jackie is somebody who wants the familiar, at least <laughs> as, as her therapist says. And so I guess maybe there's some people who enjoy this and then some people who are frustrated by it. By the film being mysterious. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and this thought, like this feel, so we talk a lot about movies, like, you know, I. I, I was surprised, when I did my first movie Night Owls, I had not planned to have this be a regular thing of doing movie events. I did it because uh, I wanted to do a movie, uh, an event on Bergman's Seven Seal, which was the fir very first Night Owls that I did. And I'm like, I love this movie, I wanna do an event on it. And then I was like, huh, this worked really, we both love talking about movies. And I think we talked because there are the, partly because there's these mystery elements that we're then, we're then trying to fill in. Or is that right or like, why is it, why are movies, why do movies lend themselves so readily to conversation? Well, people see movies, uh, I mean, movies are closer to entertainment than any other art form that I could think of offhand. Right now, anyway, you know, literature takes more time, a lot of TV shows are dismissed, and so, like, a movie is something, like, a lot of people in any given audience will have seen it even you know, without pain because it was a, a night out kind of thing. I think that's, I, as far as the mystery thing goes though, I really think different people have different ways of seeing films. Mm. There are some people that, that if a mystery is present, want an answer to it. It's kind of a natural impulse, but I think that in, you can't really do reality answering every question. And it just doesn't feel right to me. And so I make the movies in hopes that people will appreciate that an, an outside perspective on things is the way life is for us usually, that we're usually seeing things from the outside, that we usually don't know everything that's, we go, not, everything is not revealed about what we're contemplating. And that that can be effective and that could be emotionally powerful too. If you don't, you know, you hopefully not, don't frustrate people by dangling some mystery in front of them and then not solving it. But there's a lot of naturally occurring mystery in the universe. Right, so I've had this thought, and tell me what you think about it, that a big part of what art does for us is give us permission to look at things that also show up in life, but we're not allowed to look at them closely in life. Mm -hmm. So they might just be, like so much art has bad things in it. Like you, for hardly a movie doesn't have some bad thing happening in it, uh -huh. right? There, may, there, are, there is lots of art that has hardly any good things in it, but, uh, <laughs> but, but most art will have something bad and some of it will be nothing but bad stuff. And in real life, when there's bad stuff, we're sort of told to like look away or don't, you know, don't focus on the bad, accentuate the positive and uh, move on and get over it. And, 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 and like, I mean, this is a great example because this, this whole topic is, it's like a taboo. Like we're not supposed to think or talk about incest. And here we have an excuse because it's, because it's not like anything to do with us. It's like, it's just on the screen, right? And so that art gives us like permission to look at sort of the rest of, of mm -hmm. life. It's interesting because sometimes we do like it when bad things happen. I mean, sometimes we have an aspect of us that's very happy to see the train wreck of somebody else's life or the dirt of somebody else's life True. or them behaving badly. Sometimes movies can use that very definitely for audience pleasing purposes. So what you want to do is, I mean, people can want to do different things with it. In this particular case, I assumed that people were not dying to like get cozy with incest. <laughs> I assumed that the very mention of it at the beginning of the film has to be then from that time on strategized and played with and there becomes an economy of comfort and discomfort and an economy of, of pleasure that can be given from the characters versus pain that the characters are capable of dealing or discomfort that they're capable of dealing. And that becomes, that's the game here. Uh, that's the, the, the structure of this movie. Um, you need to feel something for the characters for it to work for you. Some people might not, but I did everything I could 
to, to give you something from them to compensate for the fact that they were trying to drag you towards something that maybe you wouldn't feel completely comfortable with. That's so interesting. So you really saw yourself as kind of playing this dance with the viewer, um, holding them in a certain kind of tension. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, so. That seems very Romare-esque to me. I think, <laughs> I think so, too. <laughs> um, um, so do you think that, like, Maybe this is a distinction that won't make sense to you, but you might think um, um, two possible reasons that we watch movies are to be entertained and to learn stuff. Um, and like, how much of our interest in movies is that we want to learn something? Hmm, that's a tough one for me to answer because I tend to think of movies as capital A art. I tend to want them to do the complicated things for me that capital A art has traditionally done. Admittedly, they function as entertainment um, and they can function as education. Um, I, I don't, I try to entertain people only, you know, to you know, an acceptable extent. <laughs> I really want it to feel like there's some kind of release given by the work of art when, when certain things become whole that you didn't expect would become whole. And you know, the rules of what makes it art are, are tricky, hard to describe, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying for that anyway. Rather, I'm not necessarily trying for the, um, the other two goals. I actually don't want to be teach people things or, you know, that seems like it's somebody else's job. So do you distinct, is there such a thing as a movie as being honest? Like, is that a category you would apply to a movie, honest? Yeah, but, yeah. And, and what makes a movie honest? Yeah, it could be, it's like, it's an interesting question. <clears throat> Here, you're dealing with behavior in a family, let's say, among other things. And there's certain things that we're used to from movies about family. Some of them might not be completely honest. Like some of them might, we might be like bathed in the, in the warmth of family love in some movies a little too much, whereas an actual family is mostly nuts and bolts and keeping things going. There's definitely, you know, love there, but it's not necessarily expressed in this kind of symphonic way that you see in a lot of, you know, depictions of, of families. So you could call that honesty, and I like it personally. I like the fact that the family's not always in sync with itself. There's not always a, a unified um, sense that they're all working with each other to make their lives better and to make everybody happy, and yet that you can still see some of the ways that they help each other. There's one scene I really like where I kind of choreographed everybody arriving for food, and it was... It was purposely a choreography. The mother comes in once, twice, three times, delivering food to the table. S sister comes in, takes her place at the table. Mother leaves. Jackie comes in, takes her place at the table. And everybody knew exactly what to do in, this, in my choreography because I wanted to suggest the families um, a certain harmony to the way families learn to, you know, the edges have been all sand it off of this routine. They all know exactly how to fit together at that table and, and how to um, arrive. And then, of course, Jackie can't eat anyway, so it's a little disruption. But. Right. I, uh, there's a lot of food in this movie, uh -huh. uh, a lot of like food and eating. Um, <laughs> Is that just because there's a lot of food in real life? Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's because there's a lot of food in families. And if a family doesn't provide food, it doesn't seem completely worthy of the, the, the category. That's so interesting. And that comes up in the movie, right? The mom is saying, like, yeah, exactly. Sort of it comes imp implied criticism of Yolanda's mom for not yes. putting food on the table. She's trying not to insult Yolanda's mom. Right. <laughs> There's a great scene in the beginning where Yolanda and Jackie meet, and they're being very fake, but in a very real way. <laughs> um, like they they have this like eager eagerness to 
be social and get along with each other. That, that to me, that was one of the realest things in this movie was just that. I really like that. Yolanda, as far as I know, completely sincere right, when right. Jackie comes up to her. I mean, that's not a very weird behavior to like welcome somebody into a family. And Jackie is being completely phony on the other hand. Like she's, she's, she would like this person to drop dead in front of her, but this is her, this is her way of coping with it. This is the way she's planned it, which not incidentally steals the spotlight from everybody else. Right. Um, so it's like two different things going on. And I wanted, I pointed to it, you know, I had the other sister raise her eyebrows to the mom and the mom ever discreet doesn't, play along with that tip off. Yeah, so uh, I'm interested in, so, so there's a scene where, um, uh, af right after the climactic scene, <coughs> where Matthews tells Jackie that she's powerful, and he's like, I don't, she's like, I don't think of myself as powerful. I was watching this movie with someone, and I, I was like, I wonder what he meant by that, and the person I was watching with was like, well, obviously he meant that he was sexually attracted to her. And I was like, oh, that's not how I interpreted it. I interpreted it as kind of, She's this kind of magnetic presence. Yeah. Um, like she's the person you're watching in every scene, and she she can't, she disrupts scenes a lot. Like she gets the attention on herself, and she doesn't like Will being home. Like she's like yeah. he takes all the attention. <laughs> all right. He he puts it the way she describes him. It sounds like herself. Um, I don't think I think you're right, and I don't think that um, it's necessarily. Uh, something that we is only shown during the course of this movie. They've grown up together. These are people who are raised within a sib who've gotten to know each other. Mm. And it doesn't surprise me at all that Matthew has always felt a little bit as if there's some kind of dynamo there in the family because I tried to make her that way. And she's such an exciting actress that it was a, the casting for that was perfect. I imagine that as they were growing up, Matthew always felt a little bit as if there was some that he had to play catch up almost with her energy, with her um, kind of forceful uh, ways of taking things over and making things work in the family. So, you know, through all your experience of directing actors, like, I guess you must learn a lot about human psychology, right? Because you have to get them to give you the behaviors and kind of emotions that you want from them. And that seems to be non-trivial to elicit that from a person. You know. Or is it intuitive or is it learned? They're, they're there to help you for one thing. So to make it too much of a Svengali thing would be <laughs> definitely a mistake. I mean, there are some, I mean, if you're Bergman or if you're George Cukor, if you're some amazing director of actors, you might have techniques to penetrate like the person and kind of give them a whole different level of communicating their character than they might have originally conceived. But I'm not one of those people, and I really think the casting process is where most of the work gets done. I would say 90% of the effectiveness of actors in my movies is because I was careful and I ran into the right person and I realized it at the right time and cast them. And then once you cast the right person, it's not such a strenuous process usually. All you have to do is you know, throw out the takes you don't like and they'll eventually give you one they do like because usually you can find some way of conveying where you want to go. Someone like Tally, the, the work, the work what was done when she's cast, um, the film becomes so much easier. An actress that good um, and that close to the character, that able to show you before you even cast her that she's going to be able to do that character, something like the way you want. Casting is underrated as a form of directing acting. So I'm, 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 I'm curious about that. So, so it, what goes into casting? Like, is it is it fundamentally just you have them read the words you wrote for the character, and if it sounds like the character, then that's the right person, or, or is it that you watch them in something else, and then your their way of being that other character is a tip off to you that they would be good in this, or how do you do it? Both, and and also just the 
presence of the person is really important in that film is so is going to document the person to some extent and you don't want to go crazy with the acting thing you don't you want you want nature to be cooperating with the process um, in the case of Tally I first heard about her from Joe Swanberg Chicago's own Joan Sw Joe Swanberg who had seen her in some of her early college films um, directed by Daniel Shainert. And um, I looked at those films, and there was one scene in one of those movies that made me think, that's going to be the person. And it never changed. I, the casting process was just beginning, but I, the rest of it, I was just kind of like treading water until I could tell Tally that it was um, her role. Daniel Shainert, by the way, is now famous as one of the Daniels. Maybe some of you recognize the Tally who plays Jackie here was also uh, played Becky in Everything Everywhere All at Once, the girlfriend of the daughter of the family. So she's now um, in a slightly different position than she was <laughs> when she made these movies. Um, okay, and so I have a question about um, takes. So, you know, even I asked you some questions last night and then I'm like, Ah, uh, can't ask any of those questions again because those are dead. Like I can't ask <laughs> uh. them. I can't. They won't sound real coming out of my mouth because I won't have that feeling of wanting to know the answer because I already asked them once. They're like stale now. So as an actor, that must you must not have to have that problem. Like where you can just say the same line over and over again and it doesn't like start to collapse in your mouth or something. How how do they have that power? That's to me the most amazing thing. It is amazing, and it's not. There's not one way. There are actors who, who totally get tired because they, haven't, they aren't devious enough to not be real. And so you have to try to catch them on the right take or you have to change something to, to revivify the situation for them. That's not uncommon at all. And then there are actors who have a lot of technique, which is not necessarily the better kind of actor. It's just actors who have formalized to recognize certain ways of doing things so that they can kind of consciously amp up something or bring something down and maybe produce the same result over and over again. And it's, it's a combination of those things. It's a combination of your existence at the moment and the technique that you have that you bring to it. Um, you know, Tally's pretty natural, so you, she's, it's good to like, you know, let her have her way she'll find some way to try to make it real every time, so that, which is nice. And like in real life, we tell people, don't pretend to be someone you're not. Mm -hmm. But actors spend a lot of time mm -hmm. doing that. Why is that OK for because actors? We need it. <laughs> <laughs> we need it. It is funny, isn't it? Because we, we put such emphasis on sincerity. Yeah. And then these people whose whole training is to defeat sincerity and to make, to make you feel as if they're being sincere when they're not are getting the attention from us as actors. Um, you know, there's a philosophical question, I guess, rather than a, rather than a filmmaking question because Absolutely, you know, they are, they're valuable to us, these people who can be devious in, in this way. There are some people who don't like being devious, which is what I was kind of saying before. There's certain people you just have to catch them the right way because they're determined to be authentic each time. So there are actors who kind of fit more this kind of um, model that you say society holds up. And it, it is, there's actors who, you know, don't feel right doing the same thing twice. And if you want them to do the same thing twice, you're kind of out of luck. You have to, like, go roundabout. You have to try to find some other way to revivify the process. But I, I don't think, I think most actors are just, um, have made their peace with the art of deception. I, you know, there was like five or six years in my life where I did not watch any movies because I thought they were exploitation of people getting them to do this evil thing of pretending to be someone they're not. Um, and I, I haven't actually ever really, it's not like I like came to some understanding like, no, actually, it's OK for this reason. Yeah. I didn't. I just kind of got sucked back in. Yeah, um, but yeah. it's, it's something that I, 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 I puzzle over. Um, 
when I was, this is like a, a 14 story rather than an unspeakable act story, but there's a climax, the climax of 14 has same actress, Tally, um, breaking down in, a, in the one moment in the film where she really loses it. And I, we were doing takes of it, and I was not happy, and I was just saying, let's do it again. And she got mad at me, and she looked at me and said, what do, you want, what, do you, what do you want me to do? What am I doing wrong? And I said, I don't know, it just doesn't feel real. She was being a little theatrical. And she said, all right, let's do it again. She was pissed off at me, and <laughs> she's right to be. And then she faked it the right way that time. <laughs> Once I told her what was wrong, she faked it properly. <laughs> she didn't, wasn't any more into it. Whereas, you know, Norma, who cries in the same movie, uh, insisted on being there in the breakdown, just really breaking down, kind of. Interesting. Okay, okay, we will talk more about that tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk about, like, loneliness in this movie, because there's, like, a couple, there's, first of all, a couple of scenes of Jackie riding her bike, Jackie walking by herself, and then the ending feels very lonely to me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, it's almost like, I don't know, something it leaves me thinking is like, maybe people, like, no one can really be happy and you have to just kind of, um, uh, <laughs> you, you have, you know, you have a trade off between sort of accepting the reality of unhappiness and living in fantasy or something. <laughs> Well, unfortunately for Jackie, that is kind of her condition. But that loneliness that you talk about is, it's kind of like a pleasant emptiness sometimes for me in this movie. One of the things I really like about the film is that neighborhood is so, I really like shooting there. I really like being on the streets. The natural sound of the streets is important to me in these mm. Movies. There was all we we shot at times of day where you could see the sun coming down these avenues in Midwood, and the sound of her bike is beautiful to me. The sounds of the gears changing and of the of the brake engaging as she hit, gets home. Um, I think that stuff is beautiful and um, really carries over to some extent to being in the house, which is kind of this world in itself. It's so big and so colorful and unusual that, you know, this kind of documentation of the outside world kind of transitions to this documentation of the space inside the house and the sound of the different rooms. The house is really interesting and it's wonderful at the end when she says, this house is my native country. Because you feel like this is like, this is her world. Yeah. And it's a, such a weird house. It feels like it's from another time. Like it's you know, hasn't been redone. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it feels almost like they're all living in another world, like the outside world is normal and then they come inside and then it's this like other world um, yeah. that's, that's just more in the past. Even well, she is, um, it's true, it, it, it's, a, it's a, I mean, it's a pretty house. It's, a, it's an unusual house. I was, felt very lucky to get it. But her situation is just different from other people's. She didn't need to leave her house and go out into the world and find love. You know, she had it right there. So for her, that childhood house is a different place than it is for the rest of us. It's like game over if I can make this work, you know? If I could, like, talk my brother into, like, having a life with me, um, I don't need to go to the next stage. Right, that's a great point. That's a sense in which it's her native country. Like, it's, yeah. it could be her whole world. Uh -huh. You don't have music. Like, many movies have music playing, you know, in mm -hmm. various scenes, and, and you don't do that in this movie, or... The only time I did it was when it was supposed to be coming from the environment, although I think I probably should have made that messier. But the, she goes to a club at one point where she um, picks up the schoolmate, uh, and eventually uh, has sex with him in the car. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So there's two different songs that you hear. Okay. Which are, I, I, if I were doing it now, I'd mess the soundtrack up a little bit more. It doesn't really sound, it sounds a little more commentative to me and less like real ambient sound in those scenes. But that's the only music. It's not, it's not commentative. It's not on the soundtrack for, you know, it's not me trying to change people's mood. It's, 
it's me perceiving that there would have been music in those clubs. And 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 I, as I recall from your other movies, though there might be something I'm forgetting. I, I don't recall yeah. that other kind of music anywhere. Only in the first one, and I it was good music, but I came to regret it even there. Okay, I, what was your first movie? Polly Perverse Strikes Again. I haven't seen that one. You haven't uh, seen any m music then that would be motivated by you know. Ambient music. And, all. and why not use music in the way that many other movies do to control the mood of the audience? It's in my, I mean, the way I thought of it first was um, I want to control the mood with other things. I want to control the mood with the things I have command over, with the rhythm of the shots, the distance in the, of the shots, the performances. Um, it's kind of a and what it really is is some kind of purism on my part. I chose uh -huh. to, I, I wanted to purify the process and make it somehow uh, like minimal in that regard. Um, and it's true, if I tried to put music on the soundtrack to make change people's mood, I would feel a little funny because like, how do I know that people are getting the same mood out of that music that I am? You know, I, mm. the language of film is, seems to me to be a little bit more reliable a guide to what emotions to, I, I would convey than the language of music, which is um, tricky, hmm. intricate. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a form of you know, control freaky um, purism, finally. And OK, here's another question I had for you symbolism. Like a lot of times we watch movies or read works of literature and we think, oh, is this a symbol? Like smoking, right? Uh -huh. There's a point in the, in the, they smoke together and there's a point where he's like, I think we shouldn't smoke anymore. And of course, you know, there's stuff we're learning in that scene, like just how much say he has over her. She's like, uh -huh. okay. Uh -huh. um, um, but also is this like, is the cigarettes and the giving up of cigarettes, is that supposed to be somehow symbolic? Do you see items in or, or like a, a, a thematic items in your movies as being symbolic? Do you consciously think of it that way? I don't think I do. I'm, I'm trying to give that question some play in my mind, but it's not the way I think, definitely. I mean, a symbol is going to translate into a concept eventually. I mean, it, and that's not what you're going for. You're trying to prevent people from locking things down with concepts when you're making a movie, when you're making mm. art in general. You're trying to suspend the mind to the point where it can just take things in instead of deciding that it means something. And when it means something, it's over. So, mm. so I'm not, I don't think that way. I'd have to think about it to think whether something worked acceptably as a symbol for me, but I don't like to think that way usually. Okay, I have one more question, then we'll go to the q and I've gone slightly longer than I intended to, but mm -hmm. I just had so many questions. Um, so, okay, there's something, this is a weird, she, Jackie's a weird person, but she's also in a weird family. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and one of the things that's weird about her family is the degree of openness, right? That they are pretty open with each other. Mm -hmm. And that almost feels like another layer of we're getting to peer inside, because like we're, get, we're, we're getting to peer inside and in that we're watching a movie, but we're also watching a movie about people who are unusually open. Um, is that like a choice that you made in terms of, um, you know, pre for precisely that reason, so that like it would be easy for us to access? I think that I wanted, <clears throat> Jackie to have that feeling about her relationship with her brother. And I wanted that to be true of them, that part of that pact was that they would always tell each other everything and that that was part of what she valued and that was important to me. But I didn't necessarily want that to happen everywhere. I definitely wanted everybody to be looking the other way with regard to the incest. M the mother would have had to actually, you know, happen upon them fornicating to like, to like decide that there was something really bad going right. on. And the sister was just, let me out of here, you know? Right. Let me go, I wanna get to the next room, I wanna get to the next part of my life. Um, so in some way, there's certain dynamics going on, but definitely with the sister and brother, that was one of the things I wanted to make valuable to her, that they told each other everything. Cool. Okay, um, questions, and I think I forgot to say, um, 
is that uh, you can leave at any time. <laughs> We're going to go till about 11, but you know, if you don't, it's not rude if you want to leave before then. Um, uh, so, and do I have someone who will, with a microphone, let's see. Uh, oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> do you have a microphone? No, okay. <laughs> I think that if you go around this corner right here, <laughs> there will be a microphone. And then, because that way we'll be able to hear your question. Okay, awesome. So raise your hand and we will come around to you. I see one over there. I'll have to do a couple. Okay, hi. I have a question about, about gender and I have a quick comment, which is not all of us live in redone houses and I really appreciate it just seeing <laughs> a regular house that looked like mine. Um, <laughs> the, I kept thinking during the movie about how this wouldn't work the other way around, right? Because it would have been a coercive male sibling you know, with his sister. So what, did you have any thoughts about that? And I didn't have any worked? thoughts. I didn't have any thoughts about that. But there are other, other ways besides gender to like tip the, the power imbalance. Like if I were gonna play with something like that, I probably would have made the, the boy younger. Um, make the older sister less attainable in some way because of status, because of whatever. Um, so you could probably play with it. But I, I didn't. I always had this main character being female uh, for whatever reason. And um, I, it was, I was just able to assemble it the way it was. But I think that you can... There's different, there's different, you know, there's alternatives to just having a classic, you know, a classic uh, gender configuration. You could tip that with various ways. Hi. Hey. Um, you just said a little earlier um, that. Uh, part of the purpose of films and like art in general is to suspend someone in a state such that they can just take things in and once it means something, it's over. And um, I was wondering if you could like elaborate on what you mean by that. Yeah, okay, because that's, it's a tricky thing to try to make stick in a universal way. But I think it's true in some, in some sense. I mean, obviously in any, in any work of art, and even music, even the most abstract kind of arts I, that I can think of, you, you do want things to mean something at certain points. You want to, concepts of structure, concepts of theme in certain cases to come across. But I do think it's important, I mean, that if, if everything in the film, in everything, if everything in a work of art just signifies some piece of knowledge, that we could have had um, f directly, then the thing is going to feel not like a work of art. It's going to feel very flat. I mean, Woody Allen has that kind of funny skit. I think it's in Love and Death with the, the like syphilis, you know, the the wartime like, you know, drama uh, skits that are put on, warning the soldiers about the danger of getting venereal disease or something. Uh, it was a kind of a funny, hilarious, extreme version of this sort of thing where the work of art has been so simplified that it doesn't function whatsoever as a work of art anymore. But you can make something not function as a work of art if, you, if people say, oh, I know what's going on now. That's the, end of, that's the end of something. That's the end of a certain experiential um, quality that you might want in the in the work of art at that point. It's obviously something you have to, you know, you're you're communicating through words and deeds and things that do get interpreted. So it's something that you can't be too absolute about, probably. But you have to be aware that something you need to be creating mystery on some level. Uh, to keep things from locking shut, to keep the mind from locking shut conceptually 
onto it and you know, making it an experience rather than a concept. It struck me how like a couple of people walk up to me and a couple of people walk up to William after the movie and were like, I, I really didn't know what to think of that. <laughs> so I guess you succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can uh, go too far, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, but yeah, go ahead, go ahead. This is kind of related to that. I was just really curious also, because you'd said that the reason that you don't use music in your films is because um, you, you sort of want to maybe a bit of like want to fully control the emotions yeah. with other, through other means and the music might mean something different to different people and diff have different emotional reactions. Um, I was wondering like, is it, is it also because like life doesn't have music and, <laughs> and like you want it to really be like true to real life experience? I don't think so, because life doesn't have cuts also, and life doesn't <laughs> have a certain number of things. But I think it's a control freakish thing. Like I don't reject films when they have soundtrack music. It's a good thing, because a lot of them do. Um, it, it, it's something that's done in a time-honored way. Since the dawn of movies, people have been like adding music. Um, it's a kind of a minimalist gesture to leave it out, but I think that what I said kind of, it, it, it's a little bit of a control freak thing, but I think it's true. I kind of like the idea of just cinema, you know, like uh, not even doing anything complicated. The things you can't avoid being the essential things about cinema. Where the camera is, who's in the frame, when the shot begins and ends. The things you can't avoid whatsoever are, are, it's cool to work with those things. And anything else could be um, said to be uh, excess. Uh, obviously, it's a cranky thing to call everything else excess, but in a certain, there's something pleasant about reconciling oneself to the bare bones of what you're doing, to the, the essentials of what you can do. Thank you. Um, just as we're getting to the next question, I had a thought about like I, I was also struck by this thing you said of like letting people react, um, but 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 not have a concept for it. Um, it sounds like Kant, um, Kant's idea of beauty, uh -huh. where you can never find a concept. Uh -huh. um, and I wondered whether like maybe part of it was that you're trying to create, um, you're trying to allow the closure and the unity of the movie to be when you want it to be, rather than when the viewer wants it to be. Well, that's certainly the case, but that would be the case anyway, I would think. Like, you, d you definitely, <clears throat> anybody, nobody would want the viewer to pack up at a certain point. And I, I think that, you know, you, I think that there's certain movies that don't work, and for me, anyway, and that just signal all along that they're very happy to give you a concept. I mean, the classic thing is when you know, typage of actors, you know, where someone's twirling their mustache or someone's got a white shirt on in a Western, that kind of thing. This is your classic way of, of you know, locking the mind shut on mm -hmm. that character. You are no, after that point, you're no longer going to get a lot out of the, the character themselves. You might be able to manipulate those symbols to get something else going on. Maybe the other thing will be complicated when you get it going, but you've closed a few doors along the way. Hi, um, I'm wondering like, about like, what you said about the music. Um, I feel like you kind of create like a fictional world hi, hi. in the movie where you present like different aspects of the people's lives, their house, et cetera. But, um, on the other hand, like um, I guess my question is, how often do you think about the audience and how they perceive of the movie? Because you also said that like you don't want to like manipulate them too much. So like, how often are you just telling the story of like what you what you conceive as yourself, and how often are you thinking about the audience? I think I mean it's a good question. <clears throat> I think you have to do both of those things like always, like at every. I think that's what filmmaking kind of is. At every step along the way, you're trying to give it an internal uh, existence, and you're trying to give it an external, you know, give the audience an experience that is not out of control, that you haven't, that you've 
stage managed in some way. So I think that I think that I think both these things are true. I think I, I think I'm thinking about the audience pretty much continuously. But you can't just do one thing. I don't think. I mean, if you analyze all the different things you've put into it, you're almost always doing two things. You're attending to the internal stuff in the film and attending to the film's address out to you. And it, if you leave one of those things alone, you're lucky to get away with it. So, hi. Hi. So in CEST, it could be many different things. And here it look like it's uh, her desire not to grow up, not to go to real world. And the proof of this is the dinner, is the sign of this particular life in the family that actually she does not want to change. And the mechanism of this not to change is to crawl to the brother, not permit him to move on himself. And it clearly is not realistic, but it's at least desirable. Is it really true interpretation? I think it's not a bad interpretation that she might be motivated in some way by a desire to freeze time, to freeze the family forever. But I think she has conscious <clears throat> reasons to love the brother that she has decided are the real reasons. She has a good, she can talk a good game about why she loves her brother. She, and he is in fact, uh, as far as we can tell, worthy of, of that attention. He seems like a very uh, interesting and compassionate guy in a lot of ways to me. But there is a whole possible layer of under meaning that would correspond to something like what you're speculating. The therapist in the film is kind of maybe trying to chip away at this. The therapist is not going to you know, wrap up the therapy and go home because she has convinced him that you know, the brother is really the best, you know, her favorite person, and that's <laughs> why she loves him. The therapist keeps going. Whether she arrives, she doesn't quite arrive at the answer, but that's not uncommon with therapy, it seems to me. I, one thing that's interesting about this question is that, I mean, Jackie herself suggests this interpretation to Matthew in saying, oh, you want to grow up and have adult <laughs> mature relationships, right? <laughs> like, so in, in effect, Jackie's very aware of this possibility, <laughs> and I think what's what's really sort of, to me, what's really compelling about the movie is like, in a way, it almost doesn't matter if it's true. It matters whether she can come to believe it, right? Like, if she has this other story, like, that you can just hear how compelling her story is to herself. And it's like, what, she, what are you supposed to do when you can tell yourself that good of a story? <laughs> other people can come and say, well, I've got this Freudian right, you know, <laughs> reading of you. And you're like, yeah, that sounds good, but it doesn't resonate with me. So it's, it's kind of an interesting movie about therapy in that way. It's fun to do the therapy scenes because you can show a clever therapist trying to find occasional ways of making her listen. And you can also show that that's not the end of the game, that that's not game over. The therapist hasn't scored the goal for victory. Um, it's an endless process, and it's one that doesn't always yield obvious results. Um, what was the significance or role of colors or fashion choices? Uh -huh. I think that, you know, the house was cast rather than painted. I mean, we might have painted one or two things, but it was a friend's house. We couldn't just go crazy. But the house was, we knew that we had stumbled onto a good thing when we found that house and we got permission to use it. Um, and it, it, it gave it, I mean, we wanted the house to have this sense of a kind of world unto itself with an unknown number of floors, an unknown number of rooms, and a certain richness of spirit that is kind of conveyed by all these colors, which are not completely different from each other, but are not completely the same either. 
so, but it's like, it's like acting, you know, casting is a big part of it and like location, finding the right location is a big part of it. Fashion stuff, let me think about that. Would you be able to like throw out some fashion idea, that you, some fashion that you saw in the film that you were, could think of as a? Yeah, like Jackie had <laughs> a really specific cuff <laughs> on her jeans that was <laughs> Not um, cute to me, but <laughs> no. <laughs> but it added to you know like yeah. the I noticed essence, that too. You know? I was like, oh, she's kind of short, so she mm -hmm. has to buy jeans that are too long. That's how yeah. I thought it. <laughs> yeah, we had someone to consult with about those things, but we also did draw a lot. I mean, we, I, the actors contribute some of their own clothes also, um, and it would only be up to me to kind of like um, accept or reject things that were offered. So um, it kind of grew in a way that was not too dictatorial, certainly on my part. I mean, I, I often didn't know what was going on until it was there. But, um, but I, think, I think finally it was all kind of considered in terms of the characters, at least. Um, my question is kind of in the vein of the of the previous one about mm -hmm. this idea of, um, of her kind of desiring a certain kind of stasis. And um, I, I, I'm thinking about this one cut in the film that I don't think is very important to the film, um, where there's a shot of um, like the stairway in the dark, and then you cut very abruptly to the mother sitting at the desk in this bright room and the windows are open and you can see the trees outside and the birds are going. And I, re I, I noticed my own, um, I noticed the pleasure that I felt, you know, and I also noticed that this is, this is a shot that I see a lot in films of going from a, a dark windowless mm -hmm. scene into a very bright and airy kind of thing. And how much pleasure that gives me like in that cut. And, uh, and then we're all, you know, we're, we're talking about how um, she, she wants to kind of perpetuate, she wants to stay in this situation that's kind of her childhood and that's very comfortable for her, but that I think all of us know that it's, you know, it doesn't seem so good for her to continue living that way. Um, but, but you were talking earlier about like the medium of film and Professor Callard, you were saying like, like maybe um, in real life, we're always taught to look on the on the bright side or something. But in art, we can kind of look l look at the bad thing without any mixture. Um, but I was kind of thinking maybe like in film, we're, we're kind of pushed in the opposite direction, where you're you're pushed to have the narrative arc, or you're although there are many films that violate this, you're pushed to not kind of remain in like the same kind of static situation with no development. And, I, and, and that's not like my life experience at all because if I'm in this kind of like dark, restricted, miserable room, sometimes I love that and I just wanna stay there and I don't wanna like leave and I don't want it to get bright. But like, I think all of us are kind of subject to this motivation to want the film to like progress and for her to escape that. I mean, do you think that the, me the medium is is like biased toward that. I mean, but it sounds like maybe this is something you were also intentionally trying to communicate. I don't. I think that <clears throat> I like your question, by the way. Um, I think that there are times when the film or anybody's film might be structured to make something seem endless. For instance, I think that you're talking about the end of that long first night where she comes home where the girlfriend's coming over, where there's a talk afterwards, that's like one day. And at the end of that day, there's a cut to the mother, I think. So I think that's the place we're talking about. So there we have two things going on. We have that cut, and um, it's not the first instance where you're taking some pleasure in the change and in some real life. I personally am very, very attached to those opening scenes where you hear the little slight traffic sounds and the birds in Midwood, and you hear the sound of her bicycle on those streets because we used real sound, and I think it's beautiful there. Um, but that, the mother, the scene where, uh, the first scene of the second day is indeed emphasized by sound, by light. 
I, in other words, I think there's two things. We just stretched out something a really, for a really long time. We just spent a night stretching, you know, playing with being still in the same place. It's almost like it's not camera spiel, but it's the principle of like being in the same place. And then we broke it. Both were, both were kind of part of the feeling, I think. Is that getting at anything? Would you like to, is there something I didn't answer well there? Or something I didn't answer about what you asked? Well, of course, but that's okay. I, I still enjoyed hearing what you said. Okay, good. <laughs> Can I follow up? Because I there's something interesting that interested me a lot in your question about um, where when we're, when we're watching a movie, there's a certain kind of progression that we anticipate. And that that's like part of the psychology of watching a movie, and it is not part of the psychology of watching life, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you, you, you know that life isn't just going to just progress of itself, right? Uh -huh. But the movie is supposed to progress. And even like the way you put it at the very beginning of what you said, you're like, well, you know, we know it's better for Jackie to like, you know, like, it's like, what do we know, right? Who are we? We know nothing, but all of a sudden we feel like, <laughs> I know what's good for her is this, right? Um, uh, so we, we take on this position of, I know what's supposed to happen next. And like, I know where this is going. And that's just a, that's just a, almost like a role that the viewer is cast in. Um, uh, and like, I, I'm not sure what, what question that amounts to, but that was the thing that struck me in what you were saying. I think that reminds me of something I didn't address about what you said, which is <clears throat> that personally, I think that if Matthew were willing and they wanted to go off into their incestuous life, I'm not so sure that I disapprove, to tell you the truth. I certainly didn't want to build that a disapproval like that into the movie. It wasn't, from the beginning, it looked kind of unlikely to me it, that Matthew was going to be on the same page. But I did not want to make part of this film that she was barking up the wrong tree. Uh, she has her uh, desire, which is strong, and I don't see that it will necessarily backfire on her if she gets what she wants. Thank you. I, I just don't think she will get it. <laughs> I uh, have to say I experienced this with a great feeling of universality in the sense that the awkwardness of the incest just felt like the awkwardness of getting close to any other human being. Good. Uh, sort of <laughs> like Montague, Capulet, brother, sister. But then uh, when there's the reveal at the end when she says we used to touch each other, I wish we hadn't stopped doing that, then you immediately think back to when she he says, we're going to stop smoking. So mm -hmm. that suddenly changes everything in a certain way that they actually had consummated this perhaps for a long time. And then there was an event which we don't see, uh, well, we only learn about at the very end, unless I'm completely mistaken. I wasn't thinking <clears throat> of those things as a parallel. The fact that she totally accepted the smoking, uh, at the end of smoking, to me, put it as part of her pleasant fantasy of life with him. She felt as if the way they communicated there and the way that they came to a conclusion because they were growing up and, you know, rejecting certain things, certain habits as they approached adulthood, she saw that as a positive thing and completely compatible with her wishes. So I didn't mean to make any kind of parallel between that and the fact that she mentions that they weren't, that, you know, he was, you know, feeling a little more uncomfortable with her. I personally think, you know, that she, he was feeling a little more uncomfortable, not because his feelings towards her were changing. He could just sense that she was, like, heading for the climax, that she was, like, kind of building a little dramatic structure that was going to, um, going to have a, have a end point. Uh, or am I misunderstanding that scene at the end then, which seems to refer back to a, a, an earlier period of, of actual physical intimacy? No, I don't believe that they ever slept together. I think that they were comfortable touching each other. We, we see them, for instance, in at the at the uh, Prospect Park show. We see them holding hands. 
Um, we see her cuddling next to him when he's on the phone breaking up with his girlfriend, but she just like kind of, like a cat, she just kind of like snuggles there with her pain and like listens to the conversation. Um, we see that there, that there is some physical contact that's a natural part of their relationship. I think it's not the case that they have um, gone into anything sexual at any point. And as he saw that becoming more, as he saw her getting a little bit more frisky about that, as he, he saw that she had the bit between her teeth, he was maybe backing off of his usual practice of you know, of you know touching her in non-sexual ways the way that they always have. So if I can just follow up on this because I also interpreted the way that I interpreted the thing that he said there was that there was some kind of sexual experimentation that had happened when they were children, um, mm -hmm. and you know like maybe a decade earlier or something, um, and and he's referring to that and she doesn't even really remember it, right? And that that's what he's ref that's how I interpret it that he that he refers to something like that. Is I'm that trying to remember the actual dialogue that we're talking? Maybe I, I should know what we're talking about here. But um, I mean I I think they do talk about their childhood you know interactions in such a way that like supports that thought that you know they had like every other sibling they had like you know these pre you know pubescent kind of uh, experimentation things going on, but. Uh, it certainly wasn't my imp my intention to um, carry say that they did anything like that in there. Well, I think the the line is we used to touch each other. I wish we hadn't stopped doing that, which is very suggestive to say the least. And it certainly resonates with the cigarette uh, when they when he says we're not going to smoke anymore. So it it really immediately seems to reference that. I wish I could remember exactly where that line was. I also think it was touch ourselves. <coughs> yeah. I think it was not each other, it was ourselves. Uh, and this was together. <laughs> yeah, right. And this was him. He said that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think they I think that he was like remembering early stuff. Like when they when he was talking about how she he always thought of her as a sexual being that back when they were kids um, he, she seemed uninhibited, and he was more nervous. Or, yeah, I think that's I think that's a reference to um, family history rather than rather than anything going on in the present. Hello. Um, so one of the one of the parts about your production process that I really admire is um, how you self finance through your job and like you uh, take vacations to film uh, the projects and stuff. And in interviews, I feel like the one thing I'm missing out on is like when you're like writing a script or thinking about a movie. Like, do you have like a budget number in mind when you're writing or thinking? Does that number change? And like. Another filmmaker I think you're somewhat similar to is like Hong Sang Soo in the way he like, he'll like write a script and he'll be like, oh, that's too expensive. Or like he'll <laughs> go to a coffee shop and be like, oh, and then I'm filming there a week later. <laughs> but you take much longer between projects. So Yeah, like, well, I, I hope that Hong has somebody giving him money. <laughs> um, he certainly makes enough movies that I have the feeling that there's some kind of at least small pipeline of mo money coming to him from maybe the Korean government. Mm -hmm. But when you're writing, like, how does the budget do like change, or how do you think about that? As I, don't have, I don't have that kind of um, acuity that I can be exact about budgets, but I can tell approximately a ballpark I'm in. I'm in that situation right now, because the script that I wrote after my last movies um, is one that I, all, I never wrote, because it, I always knew it was too big for me. And for the first time, some people said to me that they wanted to raise money for me. So I wrote this dream script, which is a little too big for me to do myself. I haven't heard anything about the money coming in so far, and I don't know exactly how much it would cost. It's an area that uh, I'm not expert at. I can kind of guess what the films, what, what films that are like the films I've already made might cost, making little allowances for length, for whatever, inflation maybe, I could maybe make guesses. 
but I usually just try to make my best guess and then let it rip and see how much you know how how it goes. If, if if I really you know ran into a problem, maybe I could get a little extra money from somebody, you know, borrow it from some relative <laughs> or something. But I haven't had to do that. Um, this movie cost in nineteen in two thousand and eleven and twelve. It cost about fifty thousand dollars. It would be more now, but um, and that was what I was hoping. It was not that was right in the sweet spot for me at that point. That was what I had. Um, going back to the question about therapy and also about how there are themes that maybe we feel more comfortable seeing um, in a movie but not in real life, it seems like also in therapy that's a space where we're supposed to be able to say things that uh, maybe we wouldn't be comfortable seeing in, in real life. And so I'm, I'm wondering what you think about um, in film as a space in which we can explore maybe sides of our psyches that we're not allowed to um, when we're playing, maybe living our lives. Yeah. Um, and maybe if there's other spaces in art where that happens as well. I hid some of the advances in therapy that went on here. So obviously Jackie was frozen up at first. She was a little looser later. Then at a certain point you see that she has basically spilled all the beans and can even like start venting at the therapist a little bit if she wants to. So those transitions all happen, but some of them kind of happened off screen. I think that it was fun and interesting to have therapy as something to play with there because it, that kind of you know revelation sometimes sometimes you're taken by surprise how much you know, you've opened up and how much power the therapist has to redirect the conversation. Um, that was kind of one of the fun aspects of doing therapy, that you, know, you never knew when the therapist was going to drop a little tiny bomb in there or, you know, when, you know, all the cards were on the table with regard to a certain subject that would sometimes surprise us. Um, so I think that's fun in itself. I don't know if I would... So you were talking about a certain analogy between that and the filmmaking revelation of information, maybe? Yeah, it, it seems like, uh, especially from what Professor Callert was saying before, that um, in film we are more comfortable at looking at maybe bad stuff um, and that we wouldn't be comfortable in in real life and therapy being a space also where we can uh -huh. explore ideas that we might not want to or cannot explore in real life. Um, and this is a clear uh, example, right? It, incest is not something that I think most of us would, like, it's a taboo. Uh, so we would not feel comfortable doing that. And, and But here we can kind of distance ourselves and watch it. So it's more uh -huh. about kind of like the therapeutic um, maybe power of film or art? Interestingly, w w there was a necessity here to have a character who was appealing and uh, witty and surprising, someone that was captivating to the audience. It was a necessity to have a character like that. It would have been not very fun film if you had a, a, a suppressed character, a character who didn't give us too much, who was going through the same thing. It would have had to be something very different. It would have had to have a different structure. But here, it's all, the film's almost a comedy because Jackie is such an effervescent character in some ways, and she has a lot of things that she could drop as surprises um, in our laps. Um, I was thinking. Uh, so to some extent, the use of uh, the theme of incest and the fact that the incest in the film is, a, is at least real in someone's imagination in the film, not just a theme, but a desire, that almost, that kind of goes with a certain entertainment value that one tries to give the movie, a certain pleasure one tries to give the, the storytelling. Um, that was the dynamic in my mind between those two things. 
between, you know, that was how I tried to make the audience not suffer too much with the therapy. I tried to make, give them something else it, as well. The way that I, like, maybe just to expand on the question, because yeah. I, 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 the way, in a way, the way that I think about the therapy is like, it's a way of like going inside the house. Like imagine if we couldn't go in the house, right? So imagine if you couldn't film, you know, everything's happening inside the house and you have to stay out there and you can just like barely catch a few snatches, right? Uh -huh. That wouldn't be very good. And, or imagine if, as you were saying, if Jackie weren't a very open person, yeah. right? That wouldn't be very good. And the therapy is like, it's like another window into what's happening, right? So that um, it uh, like, and the voiceover is another one actually. I think the voiceover gives us, so I feel like this movie does a lot to give you access to what's happening, like an unusual amount, right? So there are all these different avenues where it's like, you can't very well have the actor just step up and be like, let me tell you how I'm feeling audience, right? <laughs> but so you've used all these different routes to actually achieve that. And I think it's a good point that the therapy is one of them, that you can have her That's talking true. to the therapist and that like opens it up for you. I think that I think that what she said feels very right to me that the therapy is like one of many strategies and to to do that and the voiceover or Jackie's commentary some people have noted to me that it's very shifty in terms of time the you know whether it's in the past or the present mm. whether it's from the future or somebody looking back and it is I just chose whatever perspective would be the most effective at that moment. I allowed a great deal of play in that voiceover. I allowed myself to talk from the distant future if it, if it, if it gave the best perspective or in the moment if it worked better. I, I, I did not, I was not doctrinaire at all about what, what time the narrator was narrating from. Um, so I think that there is this goal in general of trying to find a lot of different ways to make the story interior and open up the inside of things. The thing that struck me about the voiceover is that it sounds a lot like a diary, but she's also denied very explicitly <laughs> having yeah, a diary. Yeah. So I almost wondered, like, does she have a secret diary that she didn't even tell the therapist about? <laughs> But that's probably over. No, I think she's <laughs> just talking to us. Let's just, let's just the. <laughs> Um, what's your creative process like, um, and do you know it to differ from other filmmakers? Um, yeah, in some ways, but creative process covers such a lot of ground. It starts from, I mean, I, I'm the only person I know, really, who, who got a, a job and doesn't spend all the money I make from it and blows it on movies on a regular basis. <laughs> So that's like weird and um, probably differs from most of the people I know who either have more conventional ways of getting money from somewhere or they stop making movies. Or it's, I don't know. I, I think I, it's different in that regard. But it also slows me down. And in addition to the slowness, it comes from that process of raising money and, and getting a, a, a script together and, and preparing it. I also am not the sort of person that wants to make movies all the time. I seem always kind of want to break after I do one because they're so strenuous. And that can stretch out a little bit depending on circumstances. So I've made five or six movies since, what, 1985 without ever giving it up or take going away from it. That's not, a, not really you know, setting the world on fire with that pace. Um, and I've spent, you know, if you, if you add all the budgets of all my movies together, we're probably talking maybe $250,000, $300,000 of my own money that went into the ether because no appreciable amount of it ever came back. I'm not complaining. I have nothing, I had nothing more I wanted to do with that movie than to, like, get a little tiny piece of film history. So I, I think it was... You know, I, I never was happier to spend money on anything. But it also is a limitation. It's not like I have another $300,000 at the drop of a hat to like do it, do twice as much. Or, um, but, um, 
because I work, I usually write the script slowly. Um, I make a decision to go. I make sure I have the vacation time and try to start getting people on board at that point. While I'm still working, I'm doing casting. I'm trying to get key people involved. By the time I go on my vacation for the movie, I would like it to be only three or four weeks before shooting. I don't want to spend too much time with that, so I'd like to do a lot of the work before I actually start this vacation period. And the shoots, if it's all in one place, if it's all in one time, which is all my movies except for one of them, I, you try to keep the shoot down to three weeks with, with one, you know, you have one day break as a general rule per week for a film. So that means 18, you'd like to keep it to around 18 shooting days. I think this one was 19 shooting days over a 22 day period. Um, so it's like slow work and you finally push yourself over the edge and work a lot really quickly. And then I edit it at home now. It's I, starting with this one, I think, I edited it at home. The one before this, I think I might have not had adequate home editing. I mean, the technology changed so much since I started making movies, so I, I had other people editing for me. I would, like, sit there, but, you know, other people were, I was working in other people's systems. But at a certain point, I think here, I started just using Avid or whatever at home. And that, I'd go back to work. I edit on my, in my spare time. I do the sound edit myself at home, um, which a lot of people don't do, but I really like to do that, actually. And, uh, and produce the, and the, final, the thing is finally done while I'm back at work. So is, that, is there any other aspect that you were curious about? Or, I mean, that's, that's the, the general. Hi. Um, so I was thinking a little bit about time, too. I feel like a bunch of movies will take place in the sort of nebulous contemporary that could be six or seven years. But here, if you look at the hairstyles and the band they're going to see and the technology that they use to send each other their like uh, video emails, it's all very much 2011, 2012. And so I feel like it's rare to see a movie that is and I understand the business decisions a lot of the time for why you wouldn't want it to be that specific, but what do you think about, uh, and how do you come to that decision to like set it in a very particular time and place? I think you're, I mean, it's, good, it's a good point. I, she even says the very first words in the film are her stating the time. She, she's riding on the bicycle and the, the voiceover goes in the summer of 2011 at the age of, you know, 18, my brother Matthew got his first real girlfriend. You know, these things are trade-offs. There's no, <coughs> to me, there's no plausible reason not to be specific about stuff. I mean, if you're, if you're going to want the commercial edge of people feeling this movie is made today rather than in 2011, then you're in a different place than I am anyway. You know, it doesn't really help me to like give up this value of specificity. And the specificity has the advantages that you're talking about. You, you know, that was the you know, the technology that people had to communicate with each other online is is very specific to the time. The Decemberists were in fact doing concerts in Prospect Park in, at that time. Um, these things are fun and cool, and I, I, I really think that there's a lot of very concrete advantages to specificity and very nebulous advantages to, to generality, especially for people who don't have a hope of making their money back in the first place. Uh, just quickly, um, I didn't know if you could pick between DeLillo, Pinchon, and David Foster Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would not pick DeLillo. Oh. <laughs> um, 
I, I think that uh, I think he would have been my third choice there. But uh, but I, w I gave I gave him the little because I wanted to start a fight. <laughs> the kid who was interrogating him, by the way, has had some success in his career. I don't know, like I can't. Mike faced was um, he was a Broadway uh, star, and then he recently became a, a little bit of a movie star with West Side Story, the remake of West Side Story that Spielberg did. So he is definitely a little further along in his life than than he was at that point. Maybe we'll take one more question. You can ask a second one since, yeah, absolutely. So um, it's, a, uh, it's a movie about taboo subject matter and loneliness, but it's also extremely funny. And I, uh, I, I revisited a conversation you did with Kent Jones about uh, Trouble in Paradise by Ernst Lubitsch. Oh, I remember. So this is kind of an influence question, but when you were writing the script or when you were watching the movie tonight, were there any lines or scenarios where like, a oh, Lubitsch would, <laughs> that's something I was thinking what about. What would Lubitsch, Lubitsch do? Yeah. That was Billy Wilder's famous phrase. Um, I wouldn't dare. I mean, I wouldn't, even back then, people didn't dare. It's like, don't, you're not Lubitsch. Don't try <laughs> to do it. Um, and with all the time that's passed, that would be a very foolhardy thing. I, I, I don't think I thought once, what would Lubitsch do? <laughs> oh, and and that's, not a, that's not a measure of disrespect. I mean, he's the man. Okay, well, thank you so much. Let's thank them. Uh, thank you. And, uh, you know, if you think of more questions about this movie, you can ask them tomorrow. <laughs> so please come back tomorrow for 14 and more conversation. And if you asked a question and didn't get a t-shirt or tote bag, come up and you can get it now.